from the Information Source, the award-winning newsmaker show, with your host, Kevin Doran. Every once in a while you do a program people talk about for a long time to come. Well, last month we had on this program with us Sam Giancana, who is the nephew of the infamous Sam Giancana, who was the head of the mob in Chicago. And uh, we talked about a lot of things. I'm going to review the sorts of things we talked about for those who didn't hear that first show. And then we got Sam back on this morning. Hi, Sam. How are you? Terrific. i got to tell you, I had an enormous reaction from your last appearance on the show. Terrific. Uh, Hopefully it was a positive one. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> very interesting. Now, now let, I have to review, you know, Sam, for those who didn't hear it. We can't go on as if everyone were there because some of these people haven't heard that show. Mm -hmm. Basically, uh, here's the, here's the, here's the layout, layout of the show. You are the uh, nephew of uh, Sam Giancana, who was the head of the mob in Chicago. Your brother, uh, your father, rather, was his brother. That's correct. Uh, you have the same name. That's correct. So from the time you were a little guy, they said, oh, there's Sam Giancana. That's right. Um, little, little Mooney, as I was called. All right, now, what, his nickname was Mooney. I wanted to establish that because we're going to be talking about Mooney. Where did he come up with a name like Mooney? That's an Irish name, as a matter of well, fact. Well, actually, uh, back in the uh, early 1920s, it was kind of a nickname uh, attributed to him because they thought he was a, a real loony kind of kid. He was willing to take dares and... Uh, they, they kind of shortened it to a loony and then and Mooney and then from Mooney to Mo. And so it was one of those things that just stuck with them until uh -huh. the 1950s. Okay, now one of the things that I found interesting in your book is the reason your uncle became the, the mobster, let me say very bluntly, the killer that he was, mm -hmm. was because his father beat him up. That's, that's what I came away with. Well, that was certainly one of, I think, the pivotal points in, in the book that we tried to describe that, you know, you never know what's going to influence an individual and certainly a child, but but Mooney's father was terribly abusive, and back in, the, or in 1910, 1915, it was common to, for him to get beatings, uh, literally be tied to a tree and beaten right. with a belt, and uh, uh, because he was an unruly kid or he wasn't obeying his father. And with that, I think either a child folds within themselves and just deteriorates, or they internalize that rage, and that's what Mooney did. And he, he then went out on the street and hung around... Uh, in a gang by the age of 12, and, and I think we, we're aware nowadays that sometimes in the inner cities, the young kids, uh, when they gravitate to a gang at that young age, uh, they do some ruthless things. Instead of being black and Hispanic, in those days it was Irish and Italian. Well, I think it was, uh, as many uh, immigrant uh, um, groups experienced, they were the low ones on the totem pole at that time, and uh, they had to do whatever it was to survive. And, and in this particular Italian community in Chicago, uh, these young kids were kind of, uh, you know, they had respect uh, by the, by the, from the elders and, and a little bit of fear because, hey, they had money in their pocket and the, the parents didn't care how they got it. And the other thing that you bring out in the book, uh, Sam, is that the Irish controlled the police department in Chicago and they were corrupt. Mm -hmm. And so you were looking at a corrupt police department that could be bought and paid for by almost anybody versus the Italians in the inner city. Was that about what it came down well, to? Well, certainly at that time in the 1920s, you had a strong Irish influence. There were others uh, that were part of the, uh, uh, the authorities, I mean, uh, judges and uh, obviously city officials, but they were all uh, on the pad. They were all uh, uh, bribed, and uh, the, uh, the mob found a way of getting their men out of, out of uh, uh, jail, and that really went uh, up into the 1960s where Chicago and Sam Giancana had influence with Mayor Daley and, uh, and other organizations. And uh, now let's get to the thing we talked about last time, Sam. Uh, he thought, Sam Giancana thought he bought and paid for Jack Kennedy. Isn't that right? Absolutely. No question about it. Uh, my uh, uncle told my father that he had a meeting in 1956 with, Jack Ken uh, with uh, Joe Kennedy, the father of Jack Kennedy, uh, because uh, Jack, uh, Joe Kennedy was concerned about... Uh, a contract that was put on his head. Uh, on Joe's head. On Joe's head, mm -hmm. because he wouldn't participate in a mob, uh, a business deal in New York. And uh, because he wouldn't do it, they put a contract on his head, and he came to Chicago and, and tried to get it removed. And Sam wanted to know what, it, what was in it for him. And uh, he said, well, listen, my son's in a position to maybe be president. If, if that's the case, uh, you'll have the ear of the president. And Joe Kennedy's history goes way back to prohibition. Uh, they got, he got his start and got his first financial win in, in, in bootlegging. And uh, with that, uh, Sam Giancana felt that he could have the ear of the president and then actively worked and got uh, the rest of the mob organization to back him. Uh, he contributed $500,000 of his own money 
to the primaries, as well as trying to get votes out and trying to mobilize Hollywood. So he felt he had bought and paid for it. And right. when Jack was made um, uh, uh, was elected president, and then in December of 1960, uh, he put Bobby Kennedy in as attorney general, and that's when they they, they thought they were being double crossed. Well, here's the thing that troubles me when I read the book, uh, Sam. Bobby Kennedy was was Jack's campaign manager. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't Bobby have known? Hey, look, we owe a favor to the mobs. We've got to lay off these guys, like you know Nixon laid off Hoffa. Mm -hmm. We've got to lay off these guys uh, because they've done us some favors. Wouldn't that message have gotten through to Bobby? Well, uh, Bobby was certainly uh, on the uh, on the communication line, and early, uh, in, uh, well, I should say, in the late 1950s, when Bobby was. Uh, uh, on the McClellan committee, the that was the council, anti, the, the he was anti, very active in hunting down the mob, and right. then he he swung over to be campaign manager. And Sam told my father that that was part of part of the the way to get uh, to appease the mob to say, hey, get them off our back. But uh, Sam specifically said that Bobby wasn't going to be any trouble. But I think what really happened was that once they became uh, once they held the office, once Jack was president. I think Joe and Bobby and Jack felt like they could erase this marker, that they didn't have to do business with these guys anymore. Okay. It, it didn't work. Now, here's the deal. If, if we had elected uh, Joe Smith and he had no ties to the mafia, didn't owe him any favors, they would not have felt that they had, you should pardon the expression, a right to bump him off. Mm -hmm because he, he wouldn't have double-crossed them. There was, no, there was no deal to begin with. Is, is, is that about right? Oh, I think so. I think that's, uh, you know, the mob uh, doesn't, uh, at that time, indiscriminately go and, uh, and, and, and kill people. I mean, they only did business with people who were willing to do business with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think this was, uh, they, they made a pact with the devil, and I think uh, they thought they could, uh, they could erase it. And uh, I don't think the Kennedys realized that not only the mob was an enemy, but also they had people, elements within the CIA that were very concerned about their future because of uh, the botched Bay of Pigs invasion uh, in 1960. So, uh, uh, 1961, excuse me. Uh, so as a result, there were many, many people uh, not happy with Jack Kennedy. Now we all know now from the, the congressional hearings, the church hearings, that the mob and the CIA worked very closely together on a number of projects uh, relating to Castro. Mm -hmm. And what you told us last time was the same guys who were involved in the attempt to bump Castro at the behest of the Kennedy brothers then got together with the mob and bumped off Jack Kennedy. Exactly. It was uh, business as usual for these people. And we even traced it further back, and our government has even admitted that back in the early 1950s, that the CIA had you uh, that had actually helped to topple uh, and affect politics around the world and topple other governments like in Iran and Guatemala and in the Philippines, mm -hmm. and they used the mob in those locales as well. So uh, by 1963, uh, this was kind of considered to be just business as usual, and that's exactly what uh, Sam had mentioned that we took care of Kennedy together. That's what his statement to my father was, and then went on to say and other men within the within the Chicago outfit who participated uh, on the mob side uh, pretty much said that they acted as a junior role to the CIA plan. Okay, and this is, this is about what, uh, what, what Stone came up with, isn't it? That's right. And I it's think also what Stone hit the nail on the head. Yeah. Uh, with the exception, he, he really focused on the military uh, aspect uh, and, and, and the initiation. And, you know, my uncle mentioned that there were some military people involved. He never said anything more than that. Uh, but Oliver Stone didn't really focus on the um, on the uh, mob side, and I think that might have been the, the twist that Garrison put on the story uh, um, because he really didn't focus on the mob. Garrison saw that uh, if you read Garrison's book, that only the CIA could have put a thing like that together. That's what he decided, and he knew that they had uh, mafia influence. But he, as you say, he emphasized the CIA, right? Well, yes, and he had he had some very close contacts with uh, the then boss Carlos Marcello in New Orleans, and uh, he may have felt that that was dangerous territory. But I think most people in, uh, in America believe that, that the mob wasn't capable of, of doing a lot of the behind-the-scenes uh, tampering with evidence and, and autopsy information and so forth, that they needed someone who, who had the ability to make those changes and uh, that uh, they were really in a position to do that, and the mob just acted as kind of muscle on the street. And, and for anybody who's aware of, of mob activities, they know that when Jack Ruby shot Lee Harvey Oswald, that I think that raised a lot of suspicion that the well, mob was involved. It, listen, I was a simple kid at the time, but I thought, here's a guy with mob background stepping out of a crowd to do the country a favor. Give me a break. <laughs> Sam, we'll be back in just a minute. I, and when I get back, I want to ask you, when you say the CIA, do you mean the CIA or just people within it? That coming up after this. Mm -hmm. 
Sam G. and Callan, nephew of the uh, famous mobster in Chicago. Sam, you yourself were never in the mobs, right? Yeah, I was fortunate that I didn't have to get into that line of work. Yeah. And your father was on the, on the periphery. That's right. He worked directly for his brother, Sam Giancana, uh, and w was not in a position that he had to do a lot of dirty work, but he was, uh, he was uh, uh, in a position to run uh, uh, businesses for my uncle, to, to do deliveries. He even went down to, uh, uh, in the 1940s to uh, Cuba and run uh, some money to uh, Meyer Lansky, so he was, uh, he was on the know. Mm -hmm. Okay, Sam, uh, what about that? Was it the CIA or just people who worked for the CIA who, who were involved in the plot? that killed Kennedy. Well, I think that's an important distinction, and, and uh, we certainly don't want to label an entire organization as being rotten. Uh, I think, you know, government is made up of people, and, and not all people are willing to live by a certain ethical uh, uh, standard, and some people have a misguided uh, sense of doing their job, and I think uh, this was certainly a group of people who felt that they were, they were in a position to uh, affect uh, activities and get the job done and that's really what we're saying and and i think that's the real moral of the story is that we as americans i think have to be an active participant in our government and with the media's help uh, be the watchdog to make sure that we have people in government who are acting ethically and properly otherwise we wind up down avenues that you know we, we see what happens now they ought not to have ever been dealing with the mafia well, that's certainly one of the other lessons, is that I think that's what appalled most Americans when we found out in the 1970s that our government was hiring mobsters to do their dirty work. And, mm -hmm. and I think that was just too much for, for most people to accept. And, uh, and certainly, you know, we know what mobsters are, and uh, we tried not to pull any punches, and we tried to tell people in, in Double Cross that, hey, this is not the kind of world that, that Hollywood has glamorized. It's ugly, they're criminals, and there's, there's, there's nothing good about it. But certainly, our government doesn't have any business to do uh, to do business with them. And I, I think we've seen in our recent past that our government has found other people to work with them. They're not mobsters now, but now you have third world countries acting as arms dealers. You've got the BCCI bank scandal. You have, you know, the Noriega connection. So our government, or elements in our government, are willing to do what it takes to uh, to move their agenda forward. So again, it wasn't the CIA, it was just people who worked there. Yeah, it um, was certainly a handful of individuals who had the power to uh, affect change, to be able to, to get uh, security reduced in Dallas, to get information uh, suppressed, and so forth. All right, let me ask you this now. Was Lee Harvey Oswald involved at all in killing the president? Uh, he was a uh, part of the plot, but uh, a very minor role. He was, he was going to be the patsy from day one. Sam Giancana said that they had found, a, that the CIA people had told him they had found someone who uh, they could pin the crime on, that had a, had a good record uh, that people would believe, and, and the plan was for him to be in Dallas, and uh, that he was supposed to uh, uh, not even fire a shot. And that's what eventually came out of Chicago. One of the men, one of the assassins for Sam Giancana said Lee Harvey Oswald didn't even get off a shot. He was in the school book depository, but never fired. And the plan was for him to leave the city and then he was going to be killed and brought back by Dallas police officers who were part of the CIA plot. Mm -hmm. And by then, all the information was already planted to label him uh, as the lone assassin. Who did the shooting? Well, it was a handful of people. Uh, there were uh, members of the mob uh, from Chicago, New Orleans, and, and uh, Tampa that comprised the mob side. And then there were several men, um, including Roscoe White and... Um, uh, uh, other men uh, from the CIA uh, who um, uh, comprised that element. So there were a handful of people on site. And uh, there were people up on the grassy knoll then? Well, my uncle and the men in, Ch in Chicago n never put a man on the grassy knoll. They told, uh, Sam specifically said that two of his men were in the school book depository on the sixth floor, one on the, on the, in the area where Lee Harvey Oswald was supposed to be and one on the other side of, of, of that, uh, that floor. And, uh, but he never placed anybody else uh, in, in specifically. Do you think the CIA had their people over on the other side then? Well, it certainly seemed they had uh, someone who uh, had uh, great marksmanship uh, to get the job done. And uh, I think there's been a lot of question about the Zapruder uh, you know, analysis and, and where the shots came from. But uh, the, the bottom line is that uh, this was not the, the, uh, the, uh, the act of one individual. And okay. I think, uh, and certainly it was a conspiracy. Sam, very often assassins get assassinated. Is that what happened to those people? 
Well, uh, I think uh, what's happened is we've realized that uh, many of the people who uh, were either directly involved or had some kind of information uh, have uh, wound up uh, mysteriously uh, dead uh, or died of questionable circumstances. I think the probability is something like two billion to one that all of these people would have met untimely deaths. And uh, that's been the case. And even Sam Gincana, he was murdered in 1975. On the very day he was to be taken back to um, Washington to testify about his activity with uh, the CIA and the attempt to assassinate Fidel okay. Castro. This is not spoiling the book for anyone, but to, to pick a few points here and there. So you no. can get the book Double Cross and read it. You'll still learn a great deal. But in the book, uh, Sam, uh, you, you indicate that your father thinks it was not another mobster who killed your uncle. It was elements of the CIA. Is that correct? Well, what we tried to do, and my father always tries to distinguish, is the, you know, uh, the, who pulled the trigger versus who ordered the hit. Uh, he feels that someone from inside the Chicago mob, someone that knew Sam Gincana very well, actually murdered him, but it was on the orders of someone else. And, and he feels, and from the information he was able to obtain from inside the mob, that the order came from the CIA, that they feared his testimony. He was 68 years old. He probably didn't want to go to jail anymore, and they thought he might talk about really 30 years of, of his life uh, working for the government. And so they, they got to uh, uh, Santos Traficante, who uh, was a, a Tampa mobster who had good contacts with the CIA as well as Chicago and found the right man to do the job. Sam, our time's about gone. I want to establish uh, what you told me last time. The reason you're allowed to talk about this, you told me, is because they don't much care if you talk about the past. They just don't want you talking about what they're doing now. Is that about right? Well, I think that that's very true, and uh, I think uh, because we've been able to be out for all over a year talking about it, I think lend some credence to that, that, you know, uh, you don't want to uh, finger anybody right now, but... Uh, uh, what we're talking about, I think, is trying to set history straight. Okay, Sam, listen, I want to do one more show with you, okay? I'd love to. Now, you, you stay on the line, and because I know I can't call you. You've got to call me. So you stay on the line, and uh, we'll, we'll book another show. Terrific. One quick question before we go. Did the mob kill Bobby Kennedy? No question that the mob was involved, and they also had help from these same government elements. Mm -hmm. the, the hotel was under control of the mob, and, and uh, Suryan Suryan was in debt to the mob. Okay. Stand by. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll get back to you just a second here. Thank you. Uh, we're talking with Sam Giancana, and uh, you've heard two interviews now. We're going to line up a third one for next month. I can't just call him. We don't know where he is. He has to call us for reasons that probably are rather obvious. So uh, we'll line up that next show with Sam. Right now, uh, we'll say goodbye for this edition of the Newsmaker Show. News coming up next from ABC on WLEA Hornell. Fourteen eighty AM. This is WLEA Hornell, New York.